The chapel is finally reopening this Sunday, March 7, 2021. And today we're looking at a passage of scripture that looks at brokenness, frailty, suffering, And it reminds us that difficulties are part of life. They are a very important part of the Christian life. In the doggy dog world in which we live in, we don't like to show vulnerability brokenness, weakness. But for the Christian, we have learned not to hide it. That's why there is the possibility for openness and transparency. We can be vulnerable because it is reality. We are not polished, glazed pots, but as Paul says, we're cracked pots, broken vessels, jars of clay. In the ancient world, oil, wine, almost any liquid was put into a clay pot and shipped. There is a hill in Rome that began with broken clay pots being tossed there throughout the city. And now it is a mountain. And that's why Paul uses this to show that through our weakness, our mortality, God's strength becomes visible and compelling. The equation for power is my weakness plus God's power reveals strength and God's power. In our world, weakness will not make you strong. Weakness only leads to more weakness. And that's why we see individuals and especially leaders in the secular world doing all that's possible not to reveal weaknesses. They put a polished look on them as if they are invincible. But the reality is God uses broken vessels. Today we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 15. Jars of clay. Paul is suffering for the gospel, and this suffering that he is dealing with means that the crucified, life-giving Jesus that's in him and others emboldens Paul's faith in preaching and results in thanksgiving and glory to God. See, it's the power, the strength, the reality of his spiritual life that allows him, through the difficulties and brokenness of life, to move on with strength and with courage and with hope. 
see this gospel that Paul is preaching takes brokenness and makes it into a power, a strength, because it reveals God's power, his purpose, his glory, his hope for the future. Affliction comes when we proclaim Christ. When we're faithful to the gospel, Jesus told us that he's sending us out as wolves, as sheep among wolves. And that is a reality that Paul is experiencing firsthand. And anyone who is persecuted for their faith realizes that this persecution whether it's emotional, social, physical, does not mean destruction, but it means that the power of the gospel shines forth, especially in and through a broken life that reveals God's power. And he says that it reenacts the crucifixion and brings the renewal of resurrection life to both the sufferer and to those in the community who come to Christ and our witness is emboldened by our confidence in the resurrection what can they do to us all they can do to us is kill us Death is nothing compared to the glory of serving Christ. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 15 in the book of 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore, I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. In 2010, an amateur treasure hunter in southwest England discovered a Roman-era pot containing over 52,000 Roman coins buried in a field a foot below the surface. He came upon a few coins with his metal detector, and his initial discovery of 21 coins turned into a much bigger find. The cracked and weather food storage pot was buried just under the ground. It may have looked like, not looked like much, but it contained 
untold riches in the form of stunning silver and bronze coins. This was reported in July 9th, 2010 on CNN. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. An unsuspecting place to find a treasure in a broken pot. See, but this is a contrast. And it contrasts the, the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant ministry that we've been looking at for the last several weeks in chapter 3 through 11, verses 18, and all the way to 4, 6, that the glory is concealed by the frail earthen container who administers it to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. See, that is the dynamic of the gospel message. It's not in the person who speaks it. It's in the power of the message, the life-changing power, which breaks sin and the hold of brokenness in a person's life. Does that mean they're going to be perfect? No. That's why we're talking about cracked pots. We are broken people. None of us are perfect. The only reason we can stand before God is because of his grace through Christ. Christ allows God to see us with perfection. God's primary intention is to choose the weak, the lowly, the despised, to accomplish his purposes so that he is not robbed of glory. See, when God takes somebody that's insignificant, I know we all like to think we're Mr. Significant, Mrs. Significant, but we're not. When you look at yourself compared to the 10,000 galaxies that we know of in the universe, and each of those galaxies has hundreds, if not thousands of stars, we look and seem pretty insignificant. But God uses the insignificant to accomplish his purpose. And he is not robbed of the glory due his name, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 29. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, struck down, but not destroyed. You know, for some in our modern world, as in, in Corinth, strength and weakness are incompatible. We can't imagine them, the two of them going together. Paul considers this the divine paradox, a paradigm of the true gospel ministry. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Last week we talked about, do you need Jesus? See, if you don't need Jesus, if you don't realize that you are broken and need him in your life daily, if you're not dependent on him to go on, to continue, to not give up. When you feel like there's nothing you can do, but see, God says he can use you at that point. So that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. See, it's only when we realize we're cracked, when we're broken, 
when we're in need of Jesus is that Jesus can use us and reveal his glory in and through our lives. As Christ's death led to the resurrection, so Paul's embodiment of Christ's death leads to the manifestation of the resurrection life. So then death is at work in us, in verse 12, but life is at work in you. Through the sufferings, through the difficulty, through the frailty, through the brokenness, to, through the defeat of life. And if you're honest, we all have it. We don't like to take, put it out there. But see, that is the one thing God can use. A broken person. A broken life. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Paul cites and he cites part of Psalm 116, verse 10, where the psalmist describes God's rescuing him from the harm, the cords of death entangled around him. See, it is, it is possible by the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, that produces faith, that the cords of death don't defeat us, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. 414. That's why we can look death in the face. And we may be called to stand up for our faith. Our world likes to think that uh, everything should be perfect. And if people are not perfect, we cancel them. We tear down their memory. We try to forget them. That's what the culture is trying to move us toward worldwide. But the reality is that we're all broken. The people in the past are broken. The people in the present are broken. And the people of the future will be broken because it is inherent in human nature. God wants us to see humanity as he sees it, with love and with compassion and with forgiveness. Although Jesus was crucified in weakness, yet he lives today by God's power. And the future resurrection of you and I puts the present suffering in perspective and leads to boldness and confidence in the present and in our future. Resurrection hope is what sustains Paul. In a few weeks, we'll be looking at the resurrection as we celebrate Easter, but it's the power of the resurrection that enables the Christian life to move forward, the spirit to work in and through us. It's not keeping rules and laws. It's living by the power of the new covenant, by the spirit, with the glory of the transforming power of Christ in our lives. Chapter 4, verse 15. All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. All this suffering, his toil, his undaunted proclamation is for their benefit. Death in us 
but life in you. Being faithful to new covenant ministry may cost you. You may not be rich. You may not be accepted. But the real thing is to have life in Christ. This motif of dying and rising with Christ is one of the most important theological themes in the letters of Paul. And it is at the heart of this passage. We see it in Romans 6, 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. At other times, however, dying with Christ is described by Paul not as a decisive event, but as a continuing experience. Not only do we die with Christ when we accept him, but we continually die that we might live. Death is not something that initiates the believer's new life alone, but it's something that defines the believer's new life. You start off by dying to self, and you continue dying to self. Sanctification isn't keep keeping rules and following and watching your P's and Q's. It is dying to self that Christ might live in and through you. Phil Yancey worked at Campus Life magazine when I was working with Youth for Christ. He was in Wheaton and I was in Arlington Heights. So we uh, oftentimes ended up on the same plane going to Youth for Christ conventions. But Phil Yancey uses a metaphor of a young woman's life to illustrate the idea of treasures in jars of clay. He talks about a, a bright and funny friend named Carolyn who suffers from cerebral palsy. And this is a, meta, a powerful metaphor for the church as for the body of Christ. He describes at a chapel service, which Carolyn wrote a speech on the day of the chapel service, Carolyn sat slumped in her wheelchair. At times, her arms jerked uncontrollably. Her head rolled and lolled back and forth to one side so that it almost touched her shoulder. And a stream of saliva sometimes ran down onto her blouse. Beside her stood her friend Josie, who read the mature and graceful prose that Carolyn had composed and centered around the Bible text. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. For the first time, some students saw Carolyn as a complete human being like themselves. Phil Yancey uses this metaphor. The scene Carolyn describes, he writes, became for me a parable of transposition, a perfect mind locked inside a spastic, uncontrolled body and vocal cords that fail at every second syllable. We, the church, are an ex example of transposition taken to extreme. Sometimes, like Carolyn's body, we obscure rather than convey the message. But the church is the reason behind the entire human experience, experiment, the reason that there are human beings in the first place. 
to let creatures other than God bear the image of God. He deemed it well worth the risk and the humiliation. On a surface level, Carolyn looked broken. But what was inside of her was a treasure. And that is true for each of us when we know Christ. We're not all what we seem. It was said of Napoleon Bonaparte that he had an unquestioned magic for victory, but no technique for defeat. The great general riding his beautiful mount at Austerlitz became the despairing horseman slouching in retreat from Moscow. That doesn't make any sense unless you know what Austerlitz was. Austerlitz was Napoleon Bonaparte's greatest victory. It was a victory, and it was it's called the War of the Three Emperors. Napoleon made himself emperor. Alexander I, the Tsar of Russia, was emperor. And Francis II of the Austria-Hungary Empire all met in Austerlitz for this immense battle. And Bonaparte, who had less soldiers, less horsemen, defeated Tsar Alexander I and the Holy Roman Emperor Francis II. He left with victory, but soon his victory turned into defeat when he tried to march his men in the winter toward Moscow. They failed miserably, and they left, and they had to slouch in defeat. To see Paul had a technique for defeat and weakness. His technique for defeat and weakness is the surpassing power that belongs to God. He was perplexed at times, yes, but not driven to despair. He was bewildered at times, yes, but not befuddled. Later, Paul would charge Timothy but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, 2 Timothy 4, 5. And this Paul himself did as God strengthened him and perfected him in his weakness. Paul was persecuted, but not forsaken pursued, hunted down, but he was never forsaken by God. Struck down means to be struck down with a weapon. He was whacked, as we might say in the mafia world. And Paul knew this kind of whacking. The events in Lystra when Paul was hunted down and ritually stoned, a ghastly, cruel thing to happen to any human being, capped by having his body being dragged outside the city to rot. But to the astonishment of his disciples, Paul popped open an eye and led them back to Lystra. The story is in Acts 14, verses 19 and 20. Merrill Tenney, 
has his own translation of these, this passage. And he translates it this way. Knocked down, but not knocked out. We serve Jesus, and that the life of Jesus might be manifested in our bodies, both here and now, and in the life hereafter. We are suffering frailties, disease, your body breaks down. We're getting old. But even in this weakness of age and physical brokenness, we can look to the life hereafter. We are squeezed, but not squashed. In despondency, yet not in despair. Confused, but not confounded. Bewildered, but not befuddled. For we live, for we who live are always being given over to the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. These sufferings that we face are not haphazard. God knows, God has a purpose. And God's will is to use his frail jars of clay to show his surpassing power than that it comes from God. George Mueller, a pastor and provider of thousands of children, was asked his secret. He hung his head and said, There was a day when I died. Then he hung it lower and said, died to George Mueller. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loses his life will find it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. See, it's humbling to accept your brokenness, to accept your, your failure. But it's the only way that leads to strength. It's humbling, but that is the road to strength and power so that we are squeezed but not squashed, bewildered but not befuddled, pursued but not abandoned, knocked down but not knocked out. The important thing about a vessel is that it is clean, that it is empty, and available for service. A vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meets the needs for the use of the master, prepared unto every good work. 2 Timothy 2, 21. We are earthen vessels that we might depend on God's power and not our own strength. We must focus on the treasure and not the vessel. See, false teachers do not have a treasure to share. All they have are museum pieces from the Old Covenant faded antiques that could never enrich a person's life. See, all the other false gospels, you have to do something. You have to observe these rules. 
You have to go door to door. You have to do something in order to receive the grace of God. But the grace of God is free. And the power of God is free. All it requires is the acknowledgement of brokenness and the need to serve God with all your heart and mind. See, the test for true ministry is not stars, but scars. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Galatians 6, 17. How can we keep from giving up? By remembering that we are privileged to have the treasure of the gospel in our vessels of clay. It's his strength. He has made something beautiful out of the brokenness of our lives, and he uses us in and through our weakness. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we need you. We need you every day. We need you every hour, as the hymn goes. Because without you, we are nothing. We can pretend to be wise and smart and good, but we're all broken and in need of the grace of God and the only way that God can fully use us, Lord, is to surrender ourselves, to die as a grain of sand buried and having rebirth and produce the fruit. We ask, Lord, that we would die each day, that we might live for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.